<laughs> I might have I, to look that up. <laughs> I, I don't find it that meaningful because what yeah. I find more meaningful is like, how distressed are you about the lack of sex you're having, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, if they're distressed by it and like they see it as they call it a sexless relationship, then yeah. But in, in the case of like a few of the couples I'm trying, I'm thinking of as I talk about this, there's, um, for them, it's like, you know, it's been like six months to a year since they've had sexual activity and um, some of them more than more than a year. And so for them, it's like, OK, let's say like penetrative sex, because that's sort of like in this he cis heterocentric script is the gold standard um, air quotes around that. For right. anyone who can't see the visual here um, in. And so for them, I'm like, OK, why don't you go and read this erotica that has no penetrative sex in it? and start thinking about and getting imaginative about what an alternative script could look like. Yes. And see if you're turned on, even though there's nothing in pen related to penetration. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And so sex doesn't have to look the way that it used to look. Yeah. The way it used to look didn't work for Hey everyone, welcome to FTS Fuck the System, a sexual liberation podcast. Today I'm here with Dr. Kristen Mark, who is a phenomenal sex researcher and a sex therapist. And I just want to give you a chance, Kristen, to introduce yourself with the first question, which is what do you love about yourself? <laughs> what do I love about myself? Um, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Hi. <laughs> and um I would say curiosity is something that like has really driven a lot of my work and my life. Like, I think that that is something that is um, very inherent in me as a human. And I think that curiosity has also served me well, maybe like as a child, it wasn't as well received. <laughs> um, but I think uh, growing into my adult self, it's definitely been something that I appreciate about my personality and about, um, yeah, just like in general, I would say that's something that I love about myself. Tell us where the curiosity has taken you. Like, give us a little bit of background on who you are, the type of amazing work you do. Sure. Yeah. So um, I consider myself, yeah, sex and relationships researcher, educator, and therapist. And um I'm currently the director of education at the Institute for Sexual and Gender Health, where I hold the Joycelyn Elders Endowed Chair for Sexual Health Education, um, which means I get to do a lot of really amazing educational like research and also, um, you know, passion projects that I get to dive into, which is really nice um, to have that flexibility. And all of my research and education and um, therapy kind of serve each other in a lot of ways, which I know you can relate to. It's just really a great, um, you know, you you learn something in a therapy session from a client and then are like, wait a minute, I don't it's have a question. Research. It becomes a question. <laughs> yeah, like I don't have any research to cite here on like really giving you some feedback with this. And I really value evidence-based practice. And so when that happens, it's sort of like, oh, this is an opportunity here. And then I value, I really strongly value disseminating sex research beyond the sort of like gatekeeping walls. Of You've been the... kicking ass on TikTok. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I got something banned, like really banned. Like they wouldn't even like yesterday, just yesterday. What? They, yeah, they like wouldn't. I appealed it and they still didn't approve me. And so that's the problem with some of these these platforms, right? Is like, we want to share our sex research beyond those paywalls of academic journals. And in trying to do that, we're getting like shadow banned off of them and blocked. Like this one was actually like removed because it violated community guidelines. And I was talking about an academic paper that like was, you know, highlighting the ways in which you can make penetrative sex more pleasurable. The vast majority of people engage in penetrative sex in some form. Yeah. And so like, this is actually a pretty important paper to highlight for people. And to just, for that to be, you know, removed because it violates some sort of prudish guideline that right. is an ill-informed guideline, um, that is a real struggle with that kind of thing. And so, mm -hmm. 
um, finding other ways like this, like your yeah. podcast and, um, you know, different ways to disseminate where you're not facing those same blockades, I think yeah. is, is really helpful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that because, uh, so I was talking to Goody Howard a few weeks ago and she was saying the same thing, but for Instagram, like she was like, you know, it's so hard to develop your following because the algorithm and the way the system's community guidelines work, block your content. I've faced it. I've experienced it. So it's, it's just like, do you want people to have comprehensive, thoughtful sex ed in the world or not? And we know the answer is usually not. That's the problem right. that we're that is, yeah. coming up against. Totally. Yeah. No, that's a huge problem. So jumping into our first question, how do you define good sex? And I also want to hear about this paper. So if you can weave it in anyway, please yeah. let me know. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. So in terms of good sex, I think, you know, this doesn't really sound that sexy, but safety is the first thing that comes to mind. And that is informed by some of my work in looking at how to experience pleasurable sex after sexual trauma. Mm. And one of our main findings in that work was like the key to pleasure is safety and sexual safety is like, you know, encompasses a lot of things. It encompasses having open communication, which we have a huge body of research that shows how important that is to great sex. Um, that um, sexual safety includes like trust and being able to let go, like feeling safe to be vulnerable yeah. is a key component of great sex. Um, I think that there's also a lot to be said for um, dynamics within people. Like, um, you know, if you feel self-conscious in front of a partner, mm -hmm. which means maybe those that safety piece isn't quite there, that self-consciousness for some people can drive like butterflies or feeling excited about the novelty, but like it may not result in the best sex because you might not feel comfortable totally letting go or like totally being yourself and being true to yourself in that sexual situation. So I think those are really crucial components to, to great sex. Yeah. In addition to um, like, not only like communicating about your sexual needs and wants outside of the sexual act, but also like communicating about them in the sexual act. Mm. And that means knowing what you like too. Mm -hmm. So being familiar with your own body and being like in touch with that and knowing what turns you on and maybe what like turns you off as well. Um, and being able to advocate for yourself in the sexual situation and feeling safe doing so. Yeah. So when you conceptualize safety, you're thinking about it from psychological safety, like your willingness and capacity to be vulnerable, which allows you to let go. And a lot of people think about it as just you using condoms or avoiding STIs or avoiding unplanned pregnancy. And you and I have done similar work in this area where sex is so much like sex research should be so much more than that. And I really appreciate your focus on expanding the ways that we even think about safety, which most people connect directly to those ends. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's so important. And, you know, that age old World Health Organization definition of sexual mm -hmm. health has like included pleasure for so long, right. like beyond risk reduction for so long. And yet sex research has taken quite a while to catch up to that and really still isn't there. Like we still have such a, you know, such a, a short sighted um, understanding of yeah. sexual pleasure and like all of the things that are necessary for sexual pleasure. And the funding windows are what make it short-sighted, I think. It's totally. like, these are the things that we are going to pay you to study. The rest of the shit, you got to get it on your own. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So finding good ways to sneak it into those funded studies. And also, yeah, I think that that's totally true. <laughs> Has your definition of good sex evolved over time? Like, where did it begin and how did you get it to be where it is now? I think so. Um, certainly that sexual safety thing has been an evolution. Mm -hmm. I haven't, um, I was, um, one of my mentors is Dennis Fortenberry and he's been talking about sexual safety for years and, um, has really kind of, uh, thought more about like, what are the settings within which you engage in sex mm -hmm. and how do those settings, like thinking about like even your physical space yeah. and how that facilitates or takes away from, that feeling of like being able to fully let go. What are some of the things in the space? Cause I didn't, 
I haven't read that, but that would be good to know. I'm a space person, so I want to know. <laughs> well, it's not like the feng, feng shui or anything. Okay. <laughs> like it's more like um, if you... So for some people, the thought of uh, being interrupted during mm -hmm. sex can be mm -hmm. really arousing. And for others, that can be really inhibiting. Mm -hmm. So it like draws upon that um, sexual inhibition, sexual excitation model of like, what are your turn ons and what yeah. are your turn offs and like what accelerates and what breaks. Mm -hmm. So Emily Nagowski explains it really nicely in her book, Come, um, Come As You Are. And so that break and accelerator model, that sexual inhibition, sexual excitation has, you know, even if you think about kids, like having kids and a kid walking in, right, you know what this <laughs> is like, a kid walking in on you having sex, if there's a potential for that, you probably aren't going to be able to get like quite into your pleasure zone. The break is always a little bit on, just if you know on. there's a kid in the house. Your foot is hovering, <laughs> yes. break, right? Like that is happening. And so that is a great example of how setting can really impact that sexual experience. Mm -hmm. Or like you think about um, being intoxicated. Yeah. For some people that can really, and also depending on your level of intoxication, right, right, can really either benefit or draw away from your sexual experience. So those types of things, or like um, on, if you have like, a bed that is like for you, like say you're dating in the dating phase and like your partner's bed is like, not like your sort of favorite, <laughs> not the best mattress, not the best mattress or like the sheets feel kind of dirty. Oh. Like you, know, you think back to your twenties when it's like, <laughs> you know, there's just like this, like, it's not quite there. And I think yeah. that is a part of setting dorm right? room the sheets. <laughs> part of your physical space so physical space can can look a lot of different ways and I think that container within which sex occurs plays a pretty big role in this and that was a piece of pleasure that I hadn't previously incorporated into my thought about it I sort of just thought like yeah let's go beyond re risk reduction let's just let's get beyond STIs and HIV yeah. and let's also incorporate pleasure messages in our approaches to STI prevention and pregnancy prevention. And that was sort of where I focused for quite a while, but mm -hmm. before I expanded into this, like really pleasure is so much more than that. And mm -hmm. when you, I've done a lot of research in like people in long-term relationships and pleasure changes over time mm -hmm. and satisfaction changes over time and desire changes over time. And that's- Can you walk through like how those three change? And you know, a lot of people conflate them but pleasure and satisfaction and desire are different. And so how do they change and are they changing uniquely each construct? Yeah, my research has mostly focused on how desire changes yeah. um, over time. And we have found that like fluctuations are really normal yeah. for on an individual level, right? And then additionally, if you have two individuals, those fluctuations are going to happen for each of you. And inevitably, you're going to face moments of one of you being up and one of you being down yeah. or the other way around. For some couples, the pattern remains where one person is higher and one person's lower. Um, but in those cases, sometimes it's about like getting into patterns that mm -hmm. are harder to break mm -hmm. as opposed to being like, I think our earlier understandings of sexual desire were that it was this trait, yeah. like Yep. You know, you'd identify as like, well, I'm a really high desire person. And we now know, we now have multiple studies that from multiple researchers that support sexual desire as more of a trait, sorry, more of a state yeah. than a trait. And so it's this state-like construct where it can fluctuate depending on, um, you know, transition to parenthood is a time mm -hmm. when it really fluctuates. Um, another time, like if you have a really stressful job, and you're experiencing a lot of stress. For some people, experiencing stress can increase their desire. And for mm -hmm. others, it increases their desire. So if you and your partner experience that differently from one another, and you're going through a really stressful phase, you're probably going to have some desire discrepancy yeah. going on. And um, so what we have found in that is like mi in mitigating those changes over time, finding ways to... Um, work on that together as opposed to pathologizing one yes. couple, which is usually the lower desire partner that gets pathologized, like finding ways to work on that together really helps with those changes over time. And so 
that's the desire piece. I think with the, um, with the pleasure piece, we don't have as much data mm -hmm. to show, right? Like there's not that I can think of. Can you think of any studies? No. That and that's what I'm curious about. Like, yeah, what, me too. I imagine, well, there's a study that's just been under review for seven months at this point. So whenever it finally gets published, maybe I'll have some data. <laughs> That, but that that partnership increases pleasure. I think we can understand that. But in what ways does partnership increase pleasure? Right. So yeah. over time, even if desire goes like this, pleasure tends to go like this because of familiarity yes. and yes, and the privileges that come with having a partnered identity status. Those are that's the argument that I'm gonna make. But it's like we'll see. That's yeah. there's only one study. I haven't found very many at all. No, me neither. And so, and I think this is a reflection of, of our sort of this being a relatively new area that yeah. people are really diving into the mechanisms of previously, maybe there was like descriptive statistics around it, mm -hmm. but not really the like, you know, mechanisms of what's driving it. And I think um, with sexual pleasure, you're right. That familiarity really helps the privilege around um, being partnered helps. Also, the um, what we tend to see is that women's desire, women's um, satisfaction from sex, which overlaps with pleasure, but is not exactly the same thing, does get better as yeah. women age. And I think it seems that the most um, reasonable explanation for that is familiarity with their own body and yes. comes in their own body and like growing into their own skin to be able to let go. And that confidence really increasing with age. Thinking awesome. about thinking about the partnership as a privilege status. Do you find that people act differently towards you when they then they realize that you're partnered? Like they yeah. they give you this credibility that you may not have earned. Like I'm, I'm trying to break that concept down. Like why do you think that I'm a better woman now or a better human being now that I'm married? Oh, one hundred percent. Like and especially as someone who like I just got married and I'm in my late thirties. So I've lived life as yes. a single person. Like, yes, I've been in long-term relationships, but that ring on my finger is like, it's so weird. It's so weird. And um, it's, it's annoying. Yes. <laughs> it's like, why, do you think, why do you think this person is less credible to talk about this thing? <laughs> totally. Even in, um, I find like in therapy sessions, it's also interesting. Yep. Like my clients. Yep really sort of see a level of credibility. It was almost like in knowing that um, I, cause some of my clients knew that like I was getting married and I feel like they were like, oh, I just assumed you were already married. Like, you know so much about this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I like, I'm a competent therapist because like, I'm also a researcher and also have been studying this for years and like, yeah, I I'm good at my job and you can be good at your job and still be single. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, so that is such a that. I'm hoping to break down like what the fuck is that? That is such a weird thing. And um I think it's it's partially and it's gender too. Like there's some sexism and patriarchy related to it. It's like of course. Yeah, yeah, more credible. And especially like I I'm, I'm bisexual and so I'm kind of like disappointed that I'm married to a man. I'm not <laughs> actually he's like wonderful, but um, but I do feel like there's a component of that where it's just like my identity then gets erased yes. too and so it's like this assumption of heterosexuality and um I think that that's a tough thing to because also marriage is so heterocentric it's like so it feels hetero. like this um yeah so like even the ring on the finger component is sort of uncomfortable it's just like ew, like this really the roots of this are in like a man owning me and yes it well with me like right? you became property you're welcome yeah exactly <laughs> and so that is like pretty frustrating yeah. <laughs> uh to say the least I mean it's actually pretty just oppressive <laughs> um but I think that so that's a component of it for sure the patriarchy and and all of that but but also with what we study I think it becomes particularly like you can't talk about this if you mm. haven't been there especially in studying long, longer term relationships yeah. it's like yeah well, how am I supposed to take advice from you? Like you haven't been, you know. You don't know what it's like. So. You don't know what it's like. Mm -hmm. Or like, why should I listen to your research? Like your research is like, you know, not based in experience. And it's yeah. like, well, it's based in like a lot of people's experience. Actually, yes. <laughs> We collected data from thousands of people, in fact. <laughs> so even if it's not me, it's them. And then, <laughs> 
systematically analyzed it in like a very, yeah, scientific method. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, okay. You, you talked about oppression a little bit, but I want to lead into this next question a bit more. What intersecting systems of oppression fuck up good sex and how? One of the main ones are scripts. Mm -hmm. Like I think heterocentric sexual scripts, cis-centric yeah. sexual scripts, those are like, they really fuck up the pleasure system. Wow. Like break that down for us. Yeah, I think like getting into the, um, you know, we have, be, because our society is super cis heterocentric, we just have these ideas about sex that we learn when we're quite young. Like, mm -hmm. and those ideas, even if we don't agree with them, even if we like bash against them, they're still really deeply ingrained. And yeah. I think it takes a lot of effort to push against those systems that um, that that really need effort to be yeah. put in, push against those. And then you add in other intersecting identities. Like you've done a lot of really great work around like the intersection of being black and yeah. being, and so then you add that in and like all of the ingrained messages received related to race, and then add in like socioeconomic stat, like you yeah. just pile these on and there's all of these scripts and the dominant script is this like very white cis hetero script of like white picket fence. Yes. Kids like sex is for reproduction. <laughs> sex is for reproduction. Totally like proper women are gatekeepers. Men are pursuers. Um, this, this message, I think around like women being gatekeepers and having to, and saying no, um, even when they mean yes, mm. has created this culture around consent that is yeah. super problematic. And especially in like the college culture, mm -hmm. there's still that feeling of, there's still that like Madonna horror complex yep. situation going on. There's still these sexual double standards where women get judged for engaging in casual sex and men get praised. And that con that combination just creates consent yeah. because women feel like they have to say no and they really mean yes. And so then they keep saying no until they say, fine, I guess I can have permission to say yes because mm. he keeps asking. So he must really want it. And then it just, sex becomes about him. Yeah, I just think all of that like really fuels this problem with pleasure and like this like orgasm gap and yeah. all of these things I mean it just really does take away from the experience of sexual pleasure when and someone comes into your office and they are reckoning with these scripts what are some things that you offer them to suggest um what are some things you suggest to help them work through it because it is a lot of work yeah I think um thinking back, one of the things that's been effective is like how you think back to where you learned about these things mm -hmm. and then sort of like going through that story, right? Like going through and even writing out a timeline of like mm -hmm. notable incidents that shaped who you are as a sexual being, yeah. um, going through and doing that, or like thinking some people, many people, like we research this stuff. So we're ingrained in it all that we're like enmeshed in it all the time. But some people have like never really thought about. Scripts. No, most people don't have right. the room or the invitation to think about it. Yeah. And, and so I think like asking people to think about it mm -hmm. is in and of itself really helpful to be like, oh, yeah, I guess I like, I guess I do believe that. And like, I don't agree with it, but it is a deeply ingrained belief. And so once you can acknowledge that, I think then you can start moving toward changing those and, and also not attributing them to you, but like yeah. attributing them to society, like society did this actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that externalization of it is super helpful for, uh, for moving forward and for changing it. Mm -hmm. um, I have some couples like think about what sorts and this is particularly for marriages that have like become or relationships that have become pretty sexless yeah um what and, would be considered sexless what's the benchmark that we use um I, there probably is like an actual clinical cutoff. there is but I don't know what it is I don't I don't either okay. 
<laughs> I might have I, to look that up. <laughs> I, I don't find it that meaningful because what yeah. I find more meaningful is like, how distressed are you about the lack of sex you're having? Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, if they're distressed by it and like, they see it as they call it a sexless relationship, then yeah. But in, in the case of like a few of the couples I'm trying, I'm thinking of, as I talk about this, there's, um, for them, it's like, you know, it's been like six months to a year since they've had sexual activity and, um, some of them more than, more than a year. And so for them, it's like, okay, so let's say like penetrative sex. Cause that's sort of like in this he- mm-hmm. cis heterocentric script is the gold standard. Um, air quotes around that for right. anyone who can't see the visual here. Um, in, and so for them, I'm like, okay, why don't you go and read this erotica that has no penetrative sex in it? And start thinking about and getting imaginative about what an alternative script could look like. Yes. And see if you're turned on, even though there's nothing in pen- related to penetration. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so sex doesn't have to look the way that it used to look. Yeah. The way it used to look didn't work for your relationship. So flip it on its head. It's not going to look like that anymore. Like yeah. it's got to be totally flipped. And this is where I think like Dan Savage often says about um, how straight couples could learn so much from queer couples in like queering up their sex life. And this is exactly related to that around how we can really like use what, I mean, queer people do this. They Mm -hmm. have to, they have to learn a new script. And so. And create one. Create their own. And that can make for a really great sex life. So everyone should be doing that. Like fuck the system, right? (laughs) (laughs) get rid of it and like create your own and like allow that to be the place that you go for pleasure. Mm -hmm. And see, okay. So I've been having this conversation related to this hierarchy. Like you said, this quote unquote gold standard around penetration. We wrote a paper about black men's masturbation and there's a qualified, like this is, if I'm having sex with a woman, this is at the top of the, a penetrative sex with a woman this is at the top of the hierarchy this has the most esteem if i'm masturbating it's a substitute it is not an equal sexual act you know like solo yeah. sexuality is not an equal sexual act and even oral sex and like digital sex like any other type of sex is not like there's there's a stepwise ladder of totally. which type of sex is the best type of sex for pleasure purposes, but I also think they don't, they don't separate it from the status that they think comes with it. And so I was wondering if that's something that you've seen or heard from your clients or in your work. Yeah, I think that status um, is really ingrained in it. I mean, you even just think about like the social construct of virginity, mm. like, you know, this is the finish line. Right. <laughs> And it's like, no, you're at the starting line. Like, why are you calling that the finish line? Like, that is like, you know, many people never even do that. And like, that is, and they're still totally satisfied and experience a ton of pleasure. And so, um, yeah, I think that's a really common misconception. And I wonder the extent to which like mutual masturbation. Mm -hmm. So where that falls did they say anything about where that falls in the hierarchy or was that part of their hierarchy wasn't even part of the consideration not surprising (laughs) it's not even considered (laughs) yeah and I think like people who aren't as comfortable with sexuality or like aren't as comfortable with sexual expression that's just like off the table like right this idea that mutual masturbation is the shit like like if you don't feel like getting all into it right you just, that's an amazing thing to get to share together. And so many people just have never experienced that or think that it's like weird or think that it's have this like perception around it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember once dating somebody who like, he had erectile issues and he like, so I was like, okay, let's just try this. And like mutual masturbation was yes. like my suggestion. And he was like, so weirded out by it. So I mean, insulted. Just, insulted and just yes. like I remember after we broke up he like made a comment about it to one of my friends and was like she wants to do this weird thing where we would like masturbate together or sue right and I was like dude you couldn't get it up like what was I supposed to do I'm trying. <laughs> I'm <gonna> help you <laughs> what like what a, come on 
And then I have a similar story. And the guy was just like, what? And I was like, well, we're not having penetrative sex because it wasn't good the last time. So do you want to try this or nothing? It's fine with me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so that was, I mean, I think that that is something that people are really uncomfortable with. And part of that is our societal like shame that we place on masturbation. And I think shame also is something that I haven't brought up yet, but like sexual shame plays such a big role in so many sexual problems and in like so much of this really um, problematic script that many of us follow. Mm -hmm. What does sexual liberation look like to you? I think that looks like, you know, getting rid of these scripts. (laughs) being free of those pressures, um, being free to like truly express yourself Mm -hmm. and be in touch with your sexuality. I think that um, one of the things that that same study of sexual trauma and pleasure, um, one of the things that that study really highlighted was how important it was to get to know yourself sexually Mm -hmm. and respect yourself sexually in a way that allows for liberation Mm -hmm. from some of this. I also in the con so in our research in longer term relationships where we've studied both members of the couple, Mm -hmm. it's been um, really interesting to see like compatibility of things like turn ons and turn offs, Mm -hmm. like don't actually matter that much if you are free to express yourself and to like talk about those things or. suggest different things to your partner without fear of them judging you like that is sexual liberty being free to do those things Mm -hmm. Um, and all of that has to do with getting out of these scripts do you think shame precedes inhibition or inhibition precedes shame oh it's probably bi-directional okay okay (laughs) i don't know what do you think i'm because i I, when you said that that's what it just uh, it was a question that came to me like, well, what came first? Was it the shame or the inhibition? You know, like I, I, I wondered about that. I'm, I'm making the guess here that shame from these scripts, like of what you should do, then there's the shame, then there's the inhibition. But I agree that there's some bi-directional relationship there. Like, right. Oh, because you might feel the inhibition and that might trigger the shame. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think it could go either way. Yeah. Um, Our messages that we receive around sex, though, especially like in such a Puritan culture Mm -hmm. of the United States, it feels like that Puritan piece is playing a role in that. Um, And that's ingrained from a really young age. So I don't know. I know that since your background is from Canada, what are the differences? Is Puritanism like foundational to Canadian culture or like what's what are the yeah. differences because y'all education system around sex is better like there's so many yeah. differences I would say one of the main differences that I noticed when I moved to the states um and I moved to the states in graduate school for graduate school and um so my, and my family all still lives there so I still have like a lot of yeah. you know Canadian I very much and um, was raised in the Canadian culture and Um, the biggest difference was the Puritan culture difference. Mm. So I was raised like I'm an atheist and was raised agnostic. Um, and I feel like I didn't know very many people who were religious. Like that just wasn't, yeah, yeah. Like it was such a minority of number of people who like identified with a religion or, or were religious. And so when I moved to the States and I moved to Indiana, um, that was very, weird yes. <laughs> to be like surrounded by people who church and God and like, you know, Christianity primarily was really like the foundation of a lot of their upbringing and also the foundation of their current lives too. Yeah. And so that was like a huge adjustment to me. I was like, wait, what you, wait, what? <laughs> and Indiana has this been on part of this, is, this month. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Like that piece, I would say that is a huge driver. Yeah in a difference. That's not to say that there's like no religious people in Canada. Of course there are, but it's not as ingrained in our culture. And it wasn't like weird for me to grow up atheist or agnostic. Like that wasn't weird. Whereas I think if I grew up in Indiana or I grew up in some parts of the States, like my best friend program, 
is was from Texas and like grew up there and you know she's like and she's still religious she's Catholic and she still goes to church and so our conversations around that were so interesting because she's just like she can't imagine anyone growing up in yeah. her community who would have been even you know consider admitting that they were agnostic or oh, wow so that that's a big cultural difference hmm. okay so that okay that is powerful because just as close as I lived to Canada, like in Niagara Falls area, there was that, that line, that barrier was so pronounced. I mean, like the, the cultural difference is so pronounced. Yeah. So that really makes a huge difference. And even how you think about what cultures adopt, what types of religions, even though they have like similar foundations for like, what's good, what's proper, what's modest, what's chaste, all of these things. Mm. Mm-hmm. yeah that's somewhere to go okay so <laughs> where would you like to be found where can folks find you learn more about you connect with you yeah um you can find me at kristenmark.com I need to update my website probably <laughs> but um that gives a link to like all of the things so I'm on tiktok as dr kristen mark on instagram as dr kristen mark um University of Minnesota Institute for Sexual and Gender Health uh, is another place where you can very easily find me and my work um, and get in touch with me through any of those places. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. And that is how you fuck the system. I can't wait to share this conversation and um, see what the folks have to say about some of these things, because this is this is so rich. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun chatting with you. No problem.